Good day, viewers. This is 300 Plus Academy, where all we do is exam tutoring, ensuring that you ace your next and every exam. Now to the concluding part of uh, NECO 2025 Biology Practical. We've looked at the first part, specimen A, B, C, D, and probable question. We've looked at E, F, G, and probable question. Now to the very last uh, and concluding part, uh, talking about specimen H to O, what are the probable uh, questions? Let's get right into it. So question one says, identify specimen H and specimen I. When you look at specimen H and I, you necessarily do not have to say it is the humerus or femur of a rabbit. You can see that in the diagram on your screen. You can just say specimen H is the humerus of a mammal. You look at the arm, that's where you have the humerus. And then the femur, that's talking about the thigh. Uh, bone. So you say specimen H is the humerus of a mammal, specimen I is the femur of a mammal. You can see that on your screen. And question two says, name the joint formed by specimen H and I. So what joint is formed by specimen H and uh, I? When you look at the humerus, just like we have in humans, humans are also mammal, by the way. So we can just use that. Uh, uh, to imitate what the humerus will work for in a rabbit and as, as well the uh, femur. So for the humerus, the humerus, the type of joint it forms proximally, that's at the top part, proximally, the proximal end is the shoulder joint, otherwise known as glenohumeral joint, talking about the glenoid cavity of the, the glenoid fossa of the uh, scapula bone linking up with the head of the uh, humerus to form glenohumeral joint or shoulder joint as the prosma and at the distal end just the same way we have the elbow joint you see the humeral bone linking up with the radius and ulna of the upper limb so what you have is proximally glenohumeral or shoulder joint at the distal end you have the elbow joint that's where the humeral bone that's the humerus links with the radius and ulna of the upper limb now looking at specimen i the femur the thigh uh, bone what sort of joint does it form proximally it forms a uh, hip joint which is a type of ball and socket uh joint at the hip that's hip joint proximally and distally you find out that the femoral bone the femur of uh, the rabbit or the mammal here as the case may be forms the knee joint it links up with the uh, tibia and fibula of the uh, lower limb that's this tally it forms the knee joint so that about answers question one and question two question three says list two structural differences between specimen h and i we are trying to look at structural difference that's Difference that we can actually see in the structure, observable structural uh, differences between specimen H and specimen I. You look at specimen H, the humerus, the head is less distinct. You look, there is a part in that diagram, you can see it on your screen, it is the head of the uh, humerus is less distinct. But when you look at the head of the femur, the thigh bone, the head is very distinct. The head of uh, the humerus is almost hemispherical. When you say hemisphere, it's just about half of a sphere. The head of the humerus is a lot smaller than that of the head of the uh, femur. So the head of the humerus is almost an hemisphere, but the head of the femur is about two thirds of a sphere that's it's even more than hemisphere almost a sphere so you look at it in the diagram so the a femur has a more prominent head three the, the distal end contains two epicondyles two processes that's the trochlea and capitulum and it also has three fossa the radial fossa the coronoid fossa and the olecranon fossa where it's you know links with the only canon process of the ulna in the forearm but when you look at the femur the distal end has two condyles separated by an epicondyle that just about answers 
that you can see that in the diagram on your screen we were told to list two structural differences between specimen h and i i have listed three so number four condyles are comparatively smaller condyles are much bigger so you can see what we mean by the condyles of the humerus and the condyles of the uh femur look at it very well again uh Condyles are comparatively smaller in numerous. Condyles are a lot bigger in uh, the femur. Can we be told to draw uh, specimen H and I? Um, maybe or maybe not. You have the images on your screen. Uh, you'll need to do well to, you know, check the link of this video for uh, the, the the lecture video on the respective. Uh, drawings we may be having in the course of this uh, exam okay um, let's move on uh, that talks about specimen H and I let's quickly look at specimen J and specimen M specimen J and specimen M have this uh, link in between them okay let's look at question 4 using a scalpel or razor blade make a cross section of specimen uh, J and state the type of placentation observed. That is, for our orange foot, if we cut in a transverse manner along the uh, horizontal plane, uh, what sort of placentation are we going to see in orange foot? Well, for not that, it is exile placentation. Exile placentation. Even when we cut the guava fruit in a transverse manner, it is still exile placentation. Okay. Question 5 says, make a drawing 10 cm to 12 cm long of the transverse section of specimen J and label fully. As you can see in the diagram on your screen, transverse section of an orange, can we be told uh, to draw that? Of course, uh, during wire class, we drew uh, the transverse section of orange fruit. The link to that particular drawing is also in the description of this uh, video, transverse section of orange food so that answers that okay moving on to question six it says make a transverse section of specimen m specimen m is guava food we should also now make a transverse section and um, it says make a transverse section of specimen m and state three observable differences between specimen j and specimen m it now means since we've cut through uh, specimen J, the orange fruit, in a transverse manner, and uh, the guava fruit in a transverse manner, we were told to compare the transverse section of specimen J and the transverse section of specimen M. Okay, when you look at the orange specimen J, few seeds are present, but in the guava, many seeds are present. If you look at uh, your orange number two, bigger and larger seeds the seeds in orange are of course bigger and larger than the seeds that you have in guava smaller seeds present when you look at specimen j the placenta is at the center it is very small when you look at the guava just like uh, very similar to that of uh, the transverse section of a tomato uh the placenta is a lot bigger or larger than the placenta you have in orange when you look at the orange succulent hairs are in the endocarp succulent hairs in the endocarp that's the part of the orange that we eat that is juicy you know succulent hairs it has hairs on the inside in the endocarp yes for the guava it also has a juicy pulp or endocarp but it has no air okay number five is that when you look at the shape of the orange it is spherical in shape but out of the guava is oval or pear shape so those are differences you know observable differences we were told to list three you can just about pick on any uh three there and you'll be good okay question still on question six roman figure two it says we should state observable similarities between specimen j and m you know their transverse section what are the observable similarities okay you look at it both are fused epicarp and mesocarp. You look at the outermost part, uh, a bit 
in uh, into the inside just before the uh, succulent juicy inside. The epicarp and the mesocarp are fused together. Both specimen J and specimen M, they have seeds. That's the orange has seeds. The guava also has seeds. Both have succulent endocarp. Just on the inside, it is succulent. It is juicy. Okay, both have exile placentation when we compare uh, the, the, the placentation of the transverse section of specimen J and specimen M. And that just about answers that. Okay, for this specimen J and M, orange food and guava fruit, okay, can we be told to name one food nutrient contained in J and M? Of course, what is contained in J and M is uh, vitamins or are vitamins but more specifically both specimen j and specimen m contains vitamin uh, c or ascorbic acid which helps to prevent scurvy uh, and that just answers that okay if we were told to name one food nutrient containing specimen j and m that's vitamin c or ascorbic acid moving on to question uh, to specimen k and l we've looked at h and i j and m now looking at specimen k and specimen l moving on to question seven uh seven a he says state the class of animal to which specimen k and l belong more like we should classify a specimen k and l into their taxonomic uh classes okay uh, normally specimen k is an arthropoda because of course uh, we've said that before jointed appendages uh the class of specimen k talking about honeybee which is a social insect is inseta inseta so if for example we we're told uh to state the order of uh honeybee that's talking about uh specimen k the class of the order of honeybees hymenoptera which means the wings that uh honeybee possess is membranous hymenoptera that is the the meaning is membranous wing so uh when we look at specimen l talking about land snail it is the it belongs to the phylum mollusca that's mollusk and the class of specimen l is gastropoda so you can see this is the actual question we're just going above and beyond for the phylum and then the uh order so specimen k talking about only b the phylum is arthropoda you know the reasons we cannot overemphasize that the class is inseta and the order of uh, only b is hymenoptera because the wings are membranous okay Specimen L, last snail, the phylum is mollusca, and the class is gastropoda. Moving to questions uh, 7, he says we should mention three reasons for classifying L, the way we had classified it here, phylum mollusca, and class gastropoda. Reasons for classifying L is that it has soft, unsegmented body. When you look at the diagram on your screen, look at the foot of the snail, it is soft, aside the shell and unsegmented okay the body is covered with a shell this is another reason for classifying this wheel then you have tentacles are uh, present and that just about answers that okay since only b belongs to the class uh insect that is a social insect like i uh said um a, and we've talked about metamorphosis uh why we were talking about specimen a b We've talked about metamorphosis as development of uh, animals from the uh, egg stage to the uh, adult stage. The sort of metamorphosis that uh, specimen K exhibits is complete metamorphosis, uh, where it moves from the egg stage to the larva stage to the pupa and then to become adult. So that's complete metamorphosis for specimen K. And that answers that. Moving on to the next question, question eight. It says, what are the economic importance of specimen K? That's talking about the only B. What are the economic importance of specimen K? Well, uh, first, the only B is a pollinating agent. You know, uh, it helps in transporting or moving pollen grains from the uh, anther, 
that's from the stamen to the uh, uh, stigma that's uh, in a flower. It's a pollinating agent number two. You can see that on your screen. Honey bee produces honey uh, for us, you know. Uh, the honey bee produces on production of honey. And this particular honey here is used in making cough syrup, body creams, lotions, ice cream, chewing gum. So um, that is talking about the economy. In fact, this is about the uh, most important uh, of the economic importance of specimen K, production of honey, which is then used in making cough syrup pharmaceutically, body creams and lotion, ice cream, chewing gum. Now, because of the second uh, economic importance, beef farming is a lucrative business for many. Beef farming, which is lucrative business, as demand for honey is high and market value is equally high. That's another economic importance. It's a lucrative business. And for countries that export honey, it's a form of foreign exchange earnings when honey is exported. So these are just about the economic importance of specimen K, talking about honey uh, B. And that just uh, takes care of that. We've looked at H and I. We've compared J and M. We've looked at K and L. We just about left with uh, specimen N and specimen O, Irish potato tuba and sweet potato tuba. As you can see on your screen, the Irish potato tuba is the yellow one, and that is uh, specimen N, and specimen O is the sweet potato, the reddish, uh, the one with the reddish brown screen. So what can we be asked here, other than uh, maybe, you know, comparison of specimen N and uh, specimen O, you need to understand that uh, specimen N, talking about uh, the Irish potato tuba, is a stem tuba. That is, it is the stem that swells, that develops, you see, fleshy underground stem is what develops into the Irish potato. So the Irish potato is a stem tuba, whereas the sweet potato is a root tuba. It is the root that swells with store starch, just the same way we have in cassava. You know, it is a root to bite. It's the root that swells with store starch. And the skin for Irish potato is yellow. You can see that on your screen. Whereas the skin for sweet potato is reddish uh, brown. And with that, we have come to the end of uh, biology uh, practical for NECO 2025. I wish you all the best from myself and the entire team. It's bye for now.